All right, beautiful Lord's Day. Amen. Beautiful Lord's Day out there. It's, it's flower planting time or whatever it is you want to plant. We're getting there. Although it was, what was it, like 27 this morning? Yeah, it was below freezing. So maybe not, maybe not quite yet. But anyway, um, this is where I, I always check and see where I leave off from the previous Sunday. Uh, my notes kind of go ahead. And um, so I like to just try to pick it up where we left off. And, and I had finished this section of Ephesians 5. Uh, but we'll, we'll use it because it's going to take us into the next set of verses from verse 18 on. Uh, and that deals with um, being drunk and so on. And we're going to touch on that here uh, shortly. But uh, let's read Ephesians 5, 11 through 17. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. And again, I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Tell, show people what is wrong. Um, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are ma made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, and not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the Democrats' days are evil. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. That's, that's adding to the Word of God. And the Democrats don't need any help, do they? As far as getting cursed by God. And liberals in general, I'm telling you, I just don't, I just don't like, I don't like people who have a liberal mindset. Uh, I don't know what it is, but it just seems like when they're wrong on one issue, they're wrong on every single other issue that there can be. And, and that's, that's kind of, I guess, what binds them all together, is that if you are, uh, if you are let's say you're a pro-BLM, then that means you have to be pro LGBTQ plus. You also have to be um, uh, pro environmentalist. You have to be vegan, uh, including now, including vegan leather on everything that you have. Yes, that's a thing too. That's a thing now. Vegan leather, uh, arti artificial leather. You can't use real leather because that this is the killing of an animal. And uh, so you have, you have to go along with every single, you have to go along with everybody's gender identification. You have to go along with that. You have to, you have to be for Palestine and the Palestinians. You have to be for open borders. You, I mean, it's just one thing after another that you have to be in favor of in order to be a, a true and genuine liberal. And I just, I don't have, that I know of, I don't have liberal friends. And I probably wouldn't make a good friend to a liberal. I probably wouldn't. I would try maybe, if I thought I could change them or whatever, if God could change them. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, because the days are, the days are evil. They're getting evil. Amen. Um, uh, let's see, where were we? Because the days are evil. Verse 17, Wherefore be ye, not un, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And that means, basically, in your world view, in your view of all of these issues that I just mentioned a while ago, that you find out what God says about that. You find that out. Okay, if you think that we should all be uh, vegan and, um, 
which I used to think the word was vegan. For some reason, I have no idea. Yeah, vegan. You have to be vegan. You ha uh, uh, find out what God says about it. Find out what, how God sees everything that goes on. And, the, and you'll find that from the word of God. And when you, are, when you are in a place or a church that does not respect and honor the word of God, I guarantee you liberalness is going to be there. They're going to be against God on probably some key issues. It's, you, just, you just wait for it to show up and it'll be there. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you, God, that, uh, Lord, as we dedicated our hearts and our mindset uh, to believe your word and what it says, that we started understanding, even though it was against what we believed in at one time, it, it start, your word started changing our view of what this world is, what it should be like, what you think about the issues that this country faces, that its politicians speak of. And Lord, that then should direct us on how we should vote, who we should vote for. Uh, Lord, what candidate best uh, follows uh, the, the belief system, God, that you lay forth in the scriptures? Lord, remind us of that, that this, that, that issue and other issues related to it are important, that they're not just minor points between two believers, that it has everything to do with how we see the authority of the, this book, the Word of God that you sent down from heaven to us. God, it does matter. Everything that you have to say in this book matters. And so, Lord, that's why we're here to study. That's why we're here to learn. And I pray, dear God, from the preacher on down to the very back pew, Lord, and then out through the uh, Internet stream and all across the world, that, God, we would all believe and speak the same thing because we believe the Word of God. Bless your people tonight. Bless our work and our labor. And, Father, Lord, make us fruitful for your kingdom's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Um, and I was going to mention back up here uh, very quickly in Ephesians 5 verse, e, let's see, verse, um, well, if, if I can't remember it, then it wasn't important. I have no doubt she'll done for work, but I'd rather prove them in shame, speak evil, things which are done to them in secret, all things proven. He says, well, I can't remember what it was. Uh, I thought I would remember it if I waited, but apparently I... I don't, so God's just saying, move on, hoggard. I'll never forget back when I wrote my sermons down on paper. I had this message and I knew that it would, that it would probably turn out to be a, a pretty good and powerful message. Just the way God was, you know, directing me in the scriptures. And um, I remember there was one part of that message that, I thought, man, this is going to be it right here. And so I, I wrote out the scriptures and I wrote out um, what I was going to say about them. And I circled that and I drew arrows to it and everything else I could so that I would not skip over that part of the message. Because I figured, man, that's going to be the thing that binds everything together. And I preached that message and it was, it was, it was a very powerful message. Um, God really stirred some people's hearts, gave an altar call. A bunch of people came down to the altar. People came to me afterwards, Pastor Mike, that was, man, that was a good message. Oh boy, I tell you what, that's, I like that kind of preaching and on and on and on. And when I went, came back up here and I grabbed my notes, I saw that even though I had made that one part of that message so prominent on the page that I couldn't miss it, I missed every bit of it. There wasn't one thing in that, that I had drew attention to, big arrows pointing to it, red ones, red arrows pointing to it, big circle around it, don't forget this. And for some reason, God didn't want me saying that. I don't know what it was, but God did not want me saying that because I just did not see it on the paper. 
while I'm preaching the message. So I've had that happen uh, several times before. All right, now, now verse 18. This is uh, uh, a study that I did, a uh, personal study that I did several years ago. I heard it from uh, another, I don't know if he was an evangelist or a, some kind of prophecy teacher or what, but, uh, but he mentioned uh, uh, the difference about being drunk versus being uh, sober. And he said uh, that uh, drunkenness in the Bible is related to false doctrine, false doctrine. Sort of like what I mentioned this morning about uh, the, the, um, the leaven. Uh, leaven and Jesus said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples finally figured out he wasn't talking about eating their bread. He was talking about beware the doctrine of the Pharisees. Don't, don't fall for what they believe in. And um, so I started, I did this study and it started out in Isaiah 28. Then I just, I went, I went through every place in the Bible that mentioned strong drink. And any place, now, uh, any place where you found strong drink, you were going to find wine with it. But not every time you find wine, do you find strong drink mentioned with it. So there's a difference in the Bible, and we'll, we'll see that here in a little bit. But Ephesians 5, verse 18, he says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is it excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Um, and I have a, uh, I've, I've used this video before. Uh, I've used it a couple times, I think. And you, you, you probably could find this on YouTube. If you, if you wanted to look for it, you'll see it. Uh, I was going to play part of it, but I thought, no, I, I'm going to I'm just devote it to the word. But it, it shows Kenneth Hagin back before he died and went to uh, wherever he went to. Um, Kenneth Hagin... And he is preaching up here in uh, Fenton, where uh, Rick Shelton used to have a church. Uh, what church was that? Can't remember the name of it. But it was up here at Fenton, and now the church uh, is the the church. The building there is used as a satellite church uh, for David Crank. I would change my name if I was going into ministry. I would change my name from Crank to something else besides Crank, Quack, David Quack, or whatever. I did. But anyway, it's a satellite church now. But anyway, when Rick Shelton was there pastoring that church, he had uh, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, uh, Copeland's wife, can't remember her name, and a couple of others that are big in the charismatic movement, that are all about uh, the, the laughter in the spirit, being drunk in the spirit, and uh, the, you know, name it, claim it, all that stuff. And they did one thing that, if you don't know the Bible, you don't know how wrong it was for them to do this. But in that church, they had sectioned off the first three rows of every section and the first three rows had different people's names on the seat. And that was where they were to sit. Now, you, you might say, well, Pastor, what's wrong with that? The book of James addresses that. Is that uh, there are people who will seek the best seats in the church. I'm just kind of paraphrasing the idea here. But he said, uh, the, the rich will want to sit up there. Don't let them. Let the poor people sit wherever they want to sit. But what had happened was they had these people there that they knew would go along with whatever was happening in the church. What, how, whatever uh, Hagen was going to lead everybody into, he knew that those people on those first three rows was going to go along with it. Okay, they knew the drill. They knew what to do. They knew when to start speaking in tongues. They knew when to start acting like they were under a drunk spirit. They knew all of those things. Okay. So anyway, uh, Hagen is, 
in this church and he's got everybody laughing, rolling on the floor. Um, Ellie Mae Clampett was there. The, uh, Donna Douglas. She was there. You could see her like she didn't make it to the third row. I think she was fourth row. But anyway, she's there. And um, Hagen is acting like he's already drunk and he's pretending to speak in tongues. And um, Hagen then is sort of giving biblical reasons why everybody should be acting like they're drunk in that church. And he quotes Ephesians 5.18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be, be, be drunk, or he said, be filled, be drunk with the Spirit. He added those words to that verse. So he says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled, be drunk with the Spirit. He added those two words and changed the meaning of it. Whereas you have the scriptures telling you, no way, Jose, on drink. No wine, no strong drink, nothing. You've got Hagen telling you, if, if you're going to be right with God, you're going to get drunk under the Spirit. Uh, I was, <laughs> back in the uh, early 2000s, I was doing some things for this group called the Prophecy Club. And they started out, Kind of, they started out kind of okay. I mean, they put on a lot, put out a lot of information back during the 90s. But um, as times went on, they really started turning out left field. Well, they wanted me to do a tour on the Da Vinci Code thing. And so I, I agreed. And um, they had taped me and in, their, in their studio church. And then they sent me out on tour. And uh, in their studio church there in Dallas, where we did the taping at, I started talking about the difference between drunk and sober in the Bible and then how wine is strong drink and how it is that there is a cup of God mentioned in the Bible and then there is a cup of devils in the Bible. And you can't drink from both. You're going to pick one or the other. And uh, so I started talking about being drunk in the spirit, drunk in the spirit. Well, after the deal, Stan Johnson, who ran that place, and his wife, who was the house prophet. So who really ran the place? They both looked at each other. He said they both looked at each other while I was speaking and said, well, obviously, Mike's never been drunk in the spirit. And they were saying that as that's something that I needed. And I'm going, no. No. No, I'm fine. I am. No, uh -uh. You don't lay. I didn't, I didn't let them lay hands on me. Nothing like that. But that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to put their hands on me and put me under a spirit of drunkenness. And I've, I've just said, absolutely not. Uh, and so I it, The funny thing is they paid for me to go around the country. Uh, basically disagreeing with their doctrine on being drunk in the spirit. And I didn't shy away from it either. Every place I went to, I said basically the same thing. I don't think everybody liked it, but that's just too bad. Because the Bible does not tell you to get drunk. The Bible does not tell you that if you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that you will pass out, or that you will be hysterical, or that you will, you will act in a drunken state, uh, or that um, you, will, you, will, you will have babbling... That's mentioned word for word in the scriptures that you'll have all these things. The Bible does not tell you that. It tells you over and over and over, be sober, be sober, be sober, be sober. So be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We'll come back to the rest of that later. Turn to Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10. And I like these people that look at this verse and they say, well, that's not for us. That's in the law. That's in the Old Testament. We don't follow that. Says who? 
Says who? Let me ask you, which lung supplies the oxygen that your body needs? The right one or the left one? They work together. Thank you. That's a very good answer. Okay. Yeah. If Chris would have said it, I would have said, did Helen tell you that? Yeah. You get oxygen from both lungs. God, God does, which nostril do you suck in air through? Whichever one's not stuffed up. Yeah. Doesn't matter what nostril. What, what ear do you hear the word of God with? It doesn't matter what ear. Left or right, it doesn't matter. And you'll find doctrine in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. They, they are not contrary to each other. They are complementary to each other. Okay? And so, um, man... If I were to, I won't start out, I won't, I won't preach all of chapter 10, but chapter 10 starts out with Nadab and Abihu. They were the sons of Aaron and buddy, they got in trouble. They took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. That got them killed. That got them killed. Because they were offering strange fire. That incense is like a type of prayer. And it basically is a false, false prayer form that they're representing here. But then in verse, uh, we pick it up in verse 8. The Lord spake unto Aaron saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou, nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Why? And he said, verse 10, that you may put difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean. He said, "If what he's saying here is if you're drunk, you cannot tell the difference between a, a clean sacrifice and an unclean sacrifice. And does it matter? All of those sacrifices were a foreshadowing of Christ. And if, and if the sacrifices can be unclean, then apparently Christ doesn't have to be sin free, does he? And so he said between unclean and clean, between holy and unholy. If you're drunk, you won't put difference between them and you'll mess up. And, you, and the whole sanctuary will be defiled with an unclean, unholy sacrifice. Aaron, I just killed your boys for offering strange fire unto, unto the Lord. So now I'm going to say this, and you know that I'm not kidding around. I don't care if it's your sons or you yourself. You are not supposed to do this. And verse 11, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So if you are drunk, you can't... You cannot discern what's holy and what's unholy. It's like the preacher I told you about here a while back that would not let sixth grade and beneath that come into the service because all of his services were PG-13. You know what that guy's problem was? His problem was he did not know the difference between clean and unclean, between holy speech and unholy speech. He did not know the difference. And it turns out he was a drunk. He had to go into rehab because he was a real, literal drunk who did not know the difference between clean and unclean language, between holy language and unholy, unholy language. And he, he wouldn't teach the children. That's what I'm seeing out of verse 11. This guy wouldn't even teach the children, didn't want them around because he knew he was going to talk dirty in that service and it wouldn't be for them. And uh, anybody like that, boy, I tell you what, mm-mm-mm. 
Um, turn to uh, Numbers chapter 6. These are the qualifications. Now, let me, let me go back to this deal here that we just learned in Leviticus 10. Apparently, you can say, well, that's number one, that's in the Old Testament. Okay. Number two, that's for the priesthood. Well, who are we? Kings and priests. Um, first, first Peter, yeah, first Peter chapter two, that we are offering up spiritual sacrifices. I, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So it does, it does count us as part of that. God's saying, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. But people do it. They'll do it anyway. Um, they, will, they will be... Oh, let me give you another example. Uh, Oral Roberts' son, Richard, took over uh, the family, or his dad's empire... When after his dad passed away, Richard Roberts now is running the show, and um, there's a video of him and somebody bragging about him, uh, about how full of the Holy Ghost is, and they said I if, I don't I don't remember it all well, but they were they were bragging about how in in one place he was uh, he was probably the biggest drunk that was there. You know, and and everybody was talking about how full of the spirit he must be under because of the way he's acting and so on and so on and so on. Wouldn't too long after that, before uh, his uh, picture shows up on the, the Tulsa News, because he got busted, he got pulled over by the Oklahoma State Patrol. He got busted for driving drunk, going home one night. He was so drunk he couldn't keep it on the road and the cop pulled him over and his mugshot, you could see it. You could see it. His eyes were just red and just, you know, how tell they, they get that glassy eye look on him and everything like that. Just everything about him. He was as drunk as could be. So not only was he a physical drunk, he was a spiritual drunk as well. And I'm not saying that all the time they go hand in hand. But in many cases, I bet you they do. Numbers chapter 6. These are the requirements of a Nazarite. You say, well, that's for, again, that's for the Nazarites. Well, a Nazarite vow is a vow of separation. Look at verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, whether, uh, when either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. There it is right there. The vow of a Nazarite, it, now let me ex explain something about this. The Nazarite vow did not always have to be a lifetime vow. You could set aside a month or two months or six months and say, okay, for six months, I'm going to separate myself uh, unto God. Uh, I'm not going to let a razor uh, to my head or my face. Uh, I'm not going to touch anything that's unclean. Uh, I'm not going to touch anything that's dead. Uh, I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm not going to eat any grapes or drink any wine or grape juice or any raisins. Uh, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm going to keep myself over to the Lord. Verse three, he shall separate himself from wine and there it is strong drink. And again, every time strong drink is mentioned, wine is mentioned. So you know that the wine being mentioned in this context is alcoholic wine. But then also he's not to drink any vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. I don't... You guys that drink vinegar, who... Who's, do you still do that? And yeah, enjoy it. Um, but that's apple cider, right? Yeah. So you could be a Nazarite and, and do that. Um, but anyway, we're vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. 
And all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. But notice this, he is to separate himself from strong drink, from alcoholic beverages. 100%, 100% total separation from those things. Turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. And, and I've had pastors that I thought, man, these are great guys. Only to find out that they said, oh, we don't have a problem with a little wine every now and then. Little, just a little bit of liquor every now and then doesn't hurt anybody. There are two types of drunks. Um, there are those that drink uh, because of the things that they like to do when they are drunk. Uh, whether it's get happy or get mean. Uh, there's the, the, your average party drunk who goes to parties and he gets drunk, he or she gets drunk, um, and they keep going to parties and they keep going to bars and, or if they'll have people over at their house and they'll drink then and so on and so on. And then you'll have people whose ha body has a physical reaction with alcohol and um, people like that they cannot not only can they not drink uh, you know, even beer they can't they can't drink a lot of cough medicines cold medicines uh, in some cases uh, meals cooked in wine because their body has a physical, literal response to it. Um, who's this guy on Friends that just died this year? Is a comedian? Matt Perry, yeah. He was being interviewed, and he had a very, very serious uh, drug problem there for a while, and he had an alcohol problem. And he said it this way, uh, because somebody had written a book, uh, somebody in England had written a book and basically said that uh, all alcoholics are that way by choice. And he said this, he said, my body has an absolutely strong, uh, unbeatable response to alcohol. And he said, now, I can make the choice to not drink the first drink. But he said, the second drink, I don't get a choice. I'm going to drink it. And he said, that's how I am. And he said, I know a lot of other people that way too. Um, I, I know a preacher that's preached here. Uh, and him and his wife both were drunks early in their marriage. And they finally, the Lord delivered them both out of it. But he, he was, they were both that way. He was, let's, let's get drunk so I can beat this guy up. He liked to get drunk and act crazy and get in fights with people. Okay, it's what he liked. Um, but his wife had a physical strong reaction to alcohol. That means she should never take the first drink, ever. Once he quit partying, he laid the bottle down, laid everything aside and walked away from it, okay? Because his body didn't react that way, but his wife did. Now, I'm not, Telling you that the Bible's giving you a license to get drunk. I'm just explaining to you, and, and there, there are places in the Bible, very limited, 
Listen, listen, Roy. It's a box about this big. Okay? And I'll explain. I'll explain it to you in a minute. Proverbs 20. Yes, sir. Sure. And Roy, I would say that you're in the second category. You can choose that first drink, yay or nay. But the second one, you don't get a choice. Once that first drink is down, there goes the bottle. Okay? There's no more left. Wine is a mocker. Say amen to that. Notice here we have strong drink again. Strong drink is raging. What does that mean? There's a boxing glove in every bottle in there. You want to get mad and get mean? Okay? The Reg, Brother Reg Kelly came here and preached several years ago, and I'll never forget what he said. But he said, I didn't like beer very much. He said, I just didn't like the taste of it, didn't like it. And uh, he said, I liked wine. And he said, uh, I liked, uh, I liked uh, Everclear. And he said, if me and my brothers, he said, if we was going to get drunk, he said, we were going to do it real fast and we're going to get real mean about it. And uh, whenever you drop the hat, I'm going to tear your head off. <laughs> and I'm going, thank you, Lord, that he's not drunk here. Amen. But he had he dealt with that before he before he really got his heart right with God. And and he would have he would have been it, a, a horrible drunk. He would have been a wife beating girl chasing drunk if it was that way. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And notice the word deceived. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So now we now we're falling into the category of of false teaching. Because just as wine and strong drink has false ideas about it. They, you know, they never advertise when they have uh, alcohol advertisements in uh, on the internet or in uh, magazines or whatever. They never show you a broken home, a, a wife and a child with bruises all over their face, uh, dirty dishes all over the place. They never show you the wrecked cars, the broken homes, the broken lives. They never show you anything like that when they advertise how much better their tequila tastes than the competition's tequila tastes. They never tell you that when they compare one beer with another. They, never, they only show you the good times, the good life, uh, how satisfying it is. How good it goes with a certain food and so on. They do not, they do not tell you the truth of what alcohol does and out what alcohol has done to this country. They, they, it deceives people into thinking that alcohol is the only thing that can make them feel better or make them feel normal with other people. It is a mocker, it is raging, and it is a deceiver. Amen. Uh, Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, this, this is... And notice it says in verse 4, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine. Um, years ago, Brother Edge's family has always been active in Missouri politics. Uh, Reg's dad was a Missouri congressman for years. Uh, Reg's brother was a Missouri congressman for several years. Now, uh, Brother Reg's youngest child, it's his, it's his daughter. I don't know if it, I don't know if he, how many girls he had. I think just one. Huh? Three daughters? So, but the youngest one, uh, is in Congress now. And, uh, back several years ago, when his brother was in Congress, 
His brother was trying to get a bill passed through the Missouri legislature that would prohibit the, um, it would prohibit the use and distribution of any alcoholic beverage on state capital grounds. Because most of the congressmen in Jefferson City, they all had a very large liquor cabinet. They were heavy drinkers, some of them. They used alcohol uh, when they had private meetings with, uh, let's say they were going to have some people who were trying to sell this congressman on a certain bill. Uh, that whole meeting would start out with, with whiskey or with uh, vodka or tequila or whatever. That whole meeting would start out with alcohol. And his brother knew uh, what it would lead to, what it leads to, what it does. And he honestly tried to get a bill passed that would prohibit alcohol on state capital grounds. Did it pass? No. Why? They want to be able to keep their alcohol. They want to be able to drink. And what does it do to the mind? It's not for kings to drink. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Uh, lest they drink and forget what? The law. That's what they're there for. And forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Now, there will come a time. In Jefferson County. When. Um, the wrong people are put in. Jefferson County politics, positions of authority, county executive, and so on. And they will take the bribe money of the casinos and they will put casinos in Kimswick, at least there, maybe, maybe in, in Festus or maybe in Crystal City. They will put casinos in Jefferson County. For when Jefferson County switched over to a county executive, uh, the first county, I don't, well, I can't remember if he was the first, but one of the early county executives that we had was a man by the name of Ken Waller. He was uh, somebody that Melissa and I went to uh, school with. Um, he was my um, insurance agent for years. And... Um, there were a few times when um, Ken would call me and ask me to meet with him somewhere uh, because he wanted my counsel just on some areas of life that he uh, was struggling with. So I think I know a little bit about him, but one of the things that I knew without a doubt about him was that as long as he was county executive, he said there will not be a casino in Jefferson County. He said, we don't need it. We don't want what that brings with it. And he said, I'm against it. And he said, as long as I'm against it, as long as I sit in the county executive seat, we are not going to have one. Uh, it's just a matter of time, however, when they start looking at how much money that brings in and, and all this and that and the other. And they will start bringing in casinos in Jefferson County along Mississippi River. And um, we're, just, we're just headed for another downfall. What, we're just putting it in fourth gear and saying, here we go. Um, the kings and the princes should not drink and they should not pervert the law or the pervert the judgment uh, uh, of what the law is and what the uh, law is all about. Now, look down at verse uh, 6, and I'm going to give you two issues, um, two exclusions in the Bible for the use of alcohol. And I'm going to start it this way. Who in here has ever had surgery before? 
Okay. Uh, was you awake? You know what I'm talking about. Um, a serious surgery where they are going to inflict large amounts of pain. They put you to sleep. Now they use, they use something stronger than alcohol actually. Combination of different gases, of medicines through your IV and whatnot. It's the reason why when you go in for surgery and, and under full anesthetic, um, they look down your throat, they look in your mouth, they want to see your teeth. Uh, they want to make sure that they can get the breathing tube. The last surgery I had was my gallbladder. And uh, they put that mask on me and said, now take three or four large breaths. It was oxygen, pure oxygen. They wanted to give me that oxygen so it would hold long enough because they were going to basically stop my breathing and insert the the trachea or the breathing tube down you know in my throat because they were going to put me under such heavy dose of whatever medicine they were going to give me that my breathing would stop and so they were breathing for me during the whole operation that's standard that's normal for that to happen we don't see a problem with that we don't see a problem with um, with doing that it's humane to do that for people okay so look at verse 6 give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy heart then we have and I don't have it up on the screen but we have Paul encouraging Timothy use a little little wine Little. And in your case, little. Little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. So we have, and I, I'd have some preachers disagree with me, that's okay. Uh, if, if somebody wants to take what I say and use it as an excuse to go do something that God clearly says don't do, that's on you. But number one, uh, people who are dying of cancer, it is immoral and inhumane to let someone die in that much pain. Uh, we dope them up with as much morphine or fentanyl. Fentanyl does have a legal use for it. It is a very, very powerful painkiller. Um, but give that to someone who is ready to die. And that way their passing from this life to the next is not spent in agonizing pain. Now, it also says, wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. This is where it would get abused the most. If you can handle your liquor and you can control the amount that you take in there is an aspect of alcohol that aids in those who suffer from chronic depression chronic depression has several uh, different causes and reasons for being there. I do, I'm not a doctor. I don't have all the answers to that. Um, I'm looking at this in, in a way that I don't think I've ever looked at it before. But I, I think it's of God. This verse does not say for you to take the wine or the strong drink in either case. It is someone else giving you the wine to those who be of heavy heart. I never saw that before in this verse. I just now saw it. So in this case, it's not even you. You don't even undertake the responsibility of how much you take. That belongs to somebody else. And it's up to them to not let you go overboard with this. 
Um, he says, let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And then again, what Paul said, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and for thine oft infirmities. Clearly, it has medicinal value, it has been used uh, as, as a medicine for thousands of years. Um, now, I would say that there may be from uh, different pharmaceutical companies something that works better and can be limited better um, for people to take for various uh, for various maladies and so on. In those cases, it's given out by prescription, which means that you can't take all you want. Uh, maybe you can the first week, but after that, you're out. And um, so it requires responsibility. But um, I just, I think that there is an allowance here in the scriptures I'm just reading it for what it says and an allowance in the scriptures for those who uh, are in a position or a place where um, they need something to help. Uh, I've suffered with anxiety and uh, depression at times and uh, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. It is a cross that I'm willing to bear I don't like it though. And uh, so I know that I have to be careful with what I take simply because of my past. And, um, and I'm willing to do that for my wife, my family, my church, and for everybody else. Um, but I'll say again, to those whose body has that, um, that reaction to alcohol, uh, and other things, um, it's not for you. Um, I, w I would seek out other methods or other things other than alcohol because your body is never, ever going to have the ability after that first drink to say no. And um, that's just the way it is. Unless God delivers you in such a way as that happens for you. And I pray that it does. Um, I, I, I personally would hate to be hooked on alcohol. And I know some preachers that have been. And it's, it's not a, yeah, it's a bad thing. All right, let's stand for prayer. It's hard to talk about that subject that way I have to be careful with what I say and how I say it so that no one misunderstands me well Pastor Mike said I could do this yeah I actually knew a, a guy and he was good born-again Christian I, I knew him we were friends we still are um, he told me he said Mike he said, I suffer every now and then from depression. He said, it hits me. It'll hang around for about four or five days, six days, something like that. And he said, I don't trust the, the drugstore. I don't trust pharmaceutical companies. I don't trust some of the stuff that they have out on the market. He says, I know what wine does for me. And he says, when those bouts come around, he said, I will take a small amount of wine to get me through those times. And he said, when the depression's gone, the bottle's gone. Don't need it. And, um, and I've never forgot that. And he's a great guy. Great, great guy. I love him dearly. Uh, if I told you his name, some of you would know the name. Uh, but anyway, just, just be careful, okay? Let's pray.